Before we get into Galatians, however, and after I've dismissed the kids, I have something I want to share with you. Um, this was brought to my mind the other night, and it's something that I, I think we need to be reminded of. Um, I was having a conversation with some people, and in the course of the conversation, it became very apparent that they were believers. Uh, they were talking to me about um, our doctrinal stance and what we believe and, and things like that. And we were having good conversation, good fellowship. But it became apparent to me after a little bit that there was one issue that was of critical importance. And they, they kind of kept steering the conversation back to this issue. And after a little bit, I, I finally kind of said, well, you know, we don't really make a big deal of that issue because it's a non-essential. And there's a little bit of a disagreement. They, they agreed that it was not an essential unto salvation. But they just, they just kept bringing the conversation back to this one particular topic. And as I was praying about it, um, I felt like I kind of needed to share with you guys that we are a one-trick pony. That's, that's what we are. We're a one-trick pony. Okay? But we have to be very specific as to what that trick is. Okay? Because we get caught up and a lot of stuff that really we don't need to be caught up in. Okay? Uh, Paul writes in, sec or in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you don't need to turn there, I'm just going to read one passage. He's speaking to the Corinthians about his ministry to them. And in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Okay? See, that's where we live, right there. That's the whole purpose of celebrating communion. It's to remind us of what we are about, what makes us different from the rest of the world. And that's Jesus Christ, who he is, the person and the nature of Jesus Christ, and him crucified in everything that that entails. And see, that's... that's all of salvation, right there. Because see, in order for us to be convinced of who Jesus is and, and why he was crucified, we have to be convinced of the first principle, and that, that is that we are lost. That as God's creation, we have willingly chosen to separate ourselves from him, and we have sinned, and we have offended him, and a righteous and holy God has cast us off. Okay? Our choice. You know, well, I never really chose that. Well, yeah, anytime you sin, you've chosen to separate yourself from God. That's why we need to understand who the person and nature of Jesus Christ is. He is God in the flesh, come to earth for one purpose. And that was the cross. Okay? The cross was to fulfill the righteous requirement that God established in his law. And that law is that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. None. And so we read in the book of Hebrews that he established the sacrificial laws of Moses where, you know, you had to do... Um, oxen and sheep and goats and birds and, and you had to keep coming and, and offering sacrifices and, and then once a year the high priest would make a sacrifice for himself and then go into the most holy place and make a sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel but every year it was the same over and over and over and over and over again because the blood of animals could never take away the sin and yet Jesus came the first time he came as the sacrificial lamb he came as the Lamb to go to the cross on our behalf. The perfect and pure Lamb that now there is no more need for sacrifice. Now see, in that one thing, we have a horrible responsibility and we have incredible freedom. 
Because see, with that sacrifice, we have a responsibility to act on that. Now, even that is kind of a misstatement because that makes it sound like we can really do anything. Really, we can't. All we do is believe. And God gives us the strength and the ability to believe. Okay? And that's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. God gives the grace. He also gives us the faith so that we can be saved. Not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Well, I did nothing to earn salvation. You can do nothing to earn salvation. You can never be good enough to merit salvation. That's why it was one perfect sacrifice once and for all. Okay? Now, with that comes incredible freedom because once we are in Christ, um, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that is Jesus Christ, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now that's an incredible freedom because see, we had no righteousness of our own. Scripture tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So all those deeds you're proud of, dirty Kleenex going in the trash. That's how God looks at them. They're, they're nothing. But he has made us his righteousness. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely flawless. Without blame. Without mark. Without anything that would besmirch us. There's a good word for you. Okay? So, in that is our hope. Because, see, there is no sin that you have committed that before God, His grace cannot cover. None. So, oh, what about the unforgivable sin? If you come before God, you have not committed the unforgivable sin. If you come to God repenting, you have not committed the unforgivable sin. Okay? Just let your minds rest in that. You want to ask, you want to talk to me about the unforgivable sin? We can talk about that later. That's not what this is about. This is about hope. Because, you know, matter where you've been, what you've done, what you've thought, who you are, all of that is covered by His grace. And that's why Paul says, I have decided to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. One trick pony. So you want to get caught up in your doctrine and your dogma and argue your philosophical and theological points. I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong because there are points that we have to take a stand on. But all too often we delight in the arguments and the quarreling and the quibbling and we get all excited and pumped up because somebody disagrees with our thinking as if we have the ability to think as God thinks. And, and we get tense, and, and we get in, and then there's separation of fellowship. Okay. Barring sin, there should never be a separation of fellowship. Okay? Barring sin. It makes it very clear in the New Testament. Where there's sin, man, if they're unrepentant, you have got to separate them from yourself. Why? In the hopes that they will, out from underneath the covering of grace that God has given us in the church, that Satan will have his way with them, and they'll go, ah, it was better under that. And they will come back in repentance. We don't kick them out like, like uh, some kind of cancer that we must excise from the body, really. Because if we're going to get rid of the cancer that's in this body, we're all going. Okay, we're all gone. And this will be an empty church. Okay? So... But if there is active sin where somebody is unwilling to repent, unwilling to turn away from their sin, and they, they are just in rebellion, no, I will not give this up, we have to put them out for their sake. That things would get so lousy and miserable for them that they would crawl back to God, throw themselves on His mercy and grace, and receive forgiveness. And we're lousy at that. We're horrible at that. Because we do one of two things. We're like, oh, it's okay. God loves you anyway. Yes, he does. He loves you enough to want to make you right. He doesn't want you to embrace your sin. He wants you to overcome it. He's made us overcomers. 
We're not defeated. Yeah, we struggle. Absolutely. That's the nature of this world that we're stuck in. But he has given us power and authority to overcome these things. Well, then we go to the other side and go, oh, you're going to hell, man. I don't want nothing to do with you. Get out. And then they come back in repentance and we're like, oh, 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 oh no, we tried it the first time. And you blew it. One and done, buddy. One and done. Out you go. And you realize by doing that, that at that point we need to excuse ourselves from church, right? Because we fall under sin as well. Okay? So hope. This is all about hope. Okay? So, there's my, there's my mini sermon. <laughs> One trick ponies. Know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So let's get over to Galatians real quick. Chapter 5. <clears throat> Been working on the series, The Fruit of the Spirit and Walking by the Spirit. I'm going to start reading um, in verse 16. So Galatians 5, chapter 5, verse 16. says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And he gives us a whole list. Now, one of the things I want to tell you right now, these are not all-inclusive lists. These are samples. Okay? Because you look at this and you go, ah, my sin's not in there. <laughs> yeah, it could be. And it should be. Paul's not trying to make an exhaustive list here. He's trying to give us indication. All right? So he goes through this list. And we get down to verse 22. He says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, the first week, we talked about this. Actually, I need to take a break. One, I need to tell you guys, you know what? I, every week, I so look forward to seeing you guys. <laughs> you know... I come from a, a pretty large family. I know compared to some of you, my family's kind of small, but there were seven of us in our family. <coughs> and then as people moved out and got married, it just got bigger from there. And we got bigger because we like to eat. We're Italian. So, <laughs> so our, our numbers got bigger and our bodies got bigger. And, but we, always, we would always get together. And, and my family's very gregarious and, and very loud. And, and just because one person's talking loud doesn't mean you should listen. It just means you need to speak louder so everybody can hear you. <laughs> That's the way my family works. Now, I know you guys look at me and think I fit right in there. Believe it or not, I don't. Because when I'm around my family, I don't talk. Hardly at all. More than I used to growing up, but, but I don't talk. Uh, Jeepers crime you. We got five other people that are just blah, 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 all over everywhere. Loud! I just kind of sit in the corner. <laughs> I can't believe I grew up in this. I can't believe I survived this. But I so look forward to being with my family. And, and I have to tell you guys, I look forward every week to being with you guys. I look out and I see people that, that I just, I love, that I love to fellowship with, that I love to be with. I love talking with you. I love hearing about you, the things that God is doing in your lives. And, and it's just a blessing to me. So, so thank you for being my family. Back to the message. That one was for free. So the first week we talked about love. Now we're not going to read you that. We're going to move on to joy. And, and I have to tell you, I've struggled with this message. Because I'm not an overly joyful person. Okay? I am more joyful now than I have been at any point previously in my life. 
But I still, I struggle with the whole idea, the concept of joy. And one of the things that I wanted to do, first I, I need, I don't know how you guys work, but I always work from a definition. I have to understand what I'm talking about before I feel even slightly qualified to talk about it. And, and to be honest with you, this week's subject, I'm only slightly qualified to talk about it, mostly because of what I've observed that I don't have. Okay? Um, the dictionary says, joy is a feeling of great happiness, a source or cause of great happiness, something or someone that gives joy to someone. Success in doing, finding, or getting something. Now, one of the things that, that has always bothered me is the difference between joy and happiness. Because there are a lot of times I'm happy, but there's not a lot of times that I have joy. And you go, well, what's the difference? They just used the same term to describe joy. They said a feeling of happiness. Yeah, except that, have you, have you noticed that happiness comes and goes, and it fluctuates and it varies depending on whether somebody is going to do something to make you happy? For example, Christmas is right around the corner, coming up much more quickly than I'm prepared for. Mm -hmm. I, I know, we just finished Halloween. And there's the Thanksgiving that we still have yet to deal with. But it seems like once we hit Halloween, the next thing I know, we're into the next year. And I'm scratching my head thinking, what happened to the last two months? Okay? But as a kid, we all had particular things that we wanted for Christmas. And we would get all pumped and, and excited and, and, and Presents would start showing up under the tree, and we're trying to guess the sizes and, and the shapes, and is that the one? And, and, and I, I have to confess, we were pretty devious as children. And one year, my mom and dad went to a Christmas party, and we thought it would be really cool to unwrap all of our presents and see what we got, and rewrap them and stick them back under the tree, and then we would fake joy on Christmas morning. <laughs> My mom is an excellent Christmas package wrapper. At that point, none of her children were. And it did not take mom more than about three seconds walking in the door to knew, she just knew what happened. You know what she did being my mom. She took every single present back and got us different presents. I didn't get a single thing on my list that year. Not one. But as kids, we get all excited because we want this one thing. Christmas morning comes open and we're there with papers flying and unless you're in some families where you know you have to peel the tape off and keep it and I don't understand. That's sick. So if you are like that, I'm just telling you right now, you're sick. Okay? Let the paper fly! Okay? And if you're worried about reusing the paper, come to my house. I'll give you a roll. Okay? So, you get, you get the present. Oh! I got it! I don't know what it is. But I got it! And Christmas is made! I guarantee you by New Year's, you didn't even know where that thing was. I, if it was still functional... If it still worked, and if it was not in many pieces, I guarantee you, you didn't know where it was. Why? Because we, we, thump, one and done. I got it, yay! What was that? And on to the next thing. On to the next thing. And, and how many of you got things that required you to get more things? Didn't that stink? Now, I don't know about you guys. You know, those of you that have birthdays like in the middle of the year, it works out well for you because you kind of get presents all year round. But for those of us that our birthday is at the end of the year, and you get it for Christmas, and you gotta wait the entire year before you get what you need to make it work, that stinks. That, that just stinks. You know? Oh yeah, it requires 60 batteries. You'll get those for your birthday. Okay? But that's, it, that's happiness. Okay? We get it. It, it, it elicits joy. We're, yeah, we're happy! What's for lunch? And we move on. That is not joy. Okay? Because you'll notice the things that he's listing out here. All of these things are fruit of what? The Spirit. The Spirit not me. It's not my ability to attain these things. 
It's not like we can just go through life going, let's see, I, I pretty well got love down. I'm working on joy. <laughs> <laughs> on that one some more tomorrow. Okay, we, it, because it's not based on our ability to accomplish these things, right? It's based on the spirit that lives in us and seals us unto salvation. Okay? Now, does that mean we just throw back in the lazy boy and wait for the spirit to do these things? We're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. The answer is no. But we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? I'm going to change the definition here, okay? And I've heard this before, you know, oh, happiness is based on happenings, and joy is based on Jesus. I, quite honestly, I'm, I'm going to change even that one, okay? I believe joy comes from knowing the true and ever-living God and having intimate, daily relationship with Him. And, and I'm going to show you how I've arrived at that because I've, I've made a study of this because, I, I, like I said, I don't really understand it. I don't understand it. Uh, my friends in high school used to make fun of me because I had the, the Glenn smile. And it was, all, it was actually Benjamin's job to make me smile growing up. That was always his goal was to make me smile. And this was my, my smile growing up. That people would, would do something they'd want me to smile on. I'd go, <laughs> do that again. <laughs> and that was, that was, you know, I am by nature and by God's fault and by sin's corruption, I tend to be serious. Well, that, that works out in my favor sometimes because um, I, I can, you know, like when you're doing weddings and funerals, you don't want to giggle. Right, Ben and Kate? Kate told me that I, I couldn't do anything that would make her laugh. So I didn't, did I? I didn't make you laugh, did I? <laughs> Boy, I wanted to. Okay, so let's get into joy. Let's take a look at this. First thing I want to I want to share with you. Um, I've got a number of passages that we're going to brush over real quick, but there's one in particular, uh, Psalm uh, 1611. Don't turn there. I'm just going to read it to you. You can write it down. You can look these up later. It says, "You make known to me the path of life. In your presence." There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, where do we find joy? In his presence. Now, this is, I found this kind of interesting because this was written in the Old Testament. And the Shekinah glory of God, the mercy seat of God, was a particular place. And they would go to that place to be in the presence of God. And, and really, even that was kind of a, a misnomer because only the high priest could one, one day a year go into the very presence of God. And they had to tie a rope onto his foot because if he was not perfect and pure in the sacrifice that he had offered and they'd have to drag him out, okay? And yet when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to that most holy place? No yeah. The veil was rent. And, and what's amazing to me is it's very specific in how it says it was rent. It says it was rent from top to bottom. God reached down and said, Zoop, the door is open. The door is open. We can now become high priests. We can go to the very throne of God. We can come before him. We can offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We can present our prayers and petitions to him. We can know that he hears us. And yet the writer in the Old Testament says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. So why do most Christians look like this? I'm a believer. <laughs> I believe you should go to church I believe you should pray I believe you should read your Bible I believe you shouldn't smoke I believe you shouldn't drink I believe <laughs> <laughs> it, 
is it any wonder the world doesn't want that? Is it any wonder the world doesn't want that? In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Now, when we come to the cross, we are given a seal that marks us as His. It is His promised Holy Spirit. It is the third part of the Trinity. The Spirit is God. So we are always in His presence. And yet Scripture also... First, you guys understand God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Do you realize that Scripture tells us that we're to seek His face? Well, if He's already here, why do I have to seek His face? I'll tell you why we have to seek His face. Because this is how we live our lives. I can't see you, God. I don't know where you are. I know you said you're everywhere, but I can't see you. Now, sometimes this is simply us covering our eyes. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's just difficulties. There are times in my life when I feel the furthest from God is when I'm going through the roughest things. And I, 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 mean, I cry out like David did. God, where are you? Where are you? And always, after he brings me through, I can look back and see that he was right there with me. Always. It's never, ever failed. But in the moment, I struggle to see him. I struggle to find him. So let's take a look at a couple things here. So if we have fullness of joy in his presence, how do we get into his presence? First Chronicles 22, 19 says, Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Okay? So the first thing that we need to see is that there is a something we have to do. There's an active participation on our part, right? So we have to engage. We have to engage with our mind. We have to engage with our heart. Now you've heard me say before, and I'm convinced of this, we have got to learn to control our thoughts. Okay? We have got to learn to control our thoughts. That's part of discipline. You see what he says here? Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We have to choose what we are going to think about. Now, my thoughts run quick. And a lot of times I can't even finish what I'm saying because my brain has moved on to something else and my, my sentences just kind of peter out. That's why I have Christy. If my sentences peter out with you, look to her. She'll finish them for me. <laughs> She does that for me often. Because I, man, I'm, I've got four things in my head. I've got to try and get them all out in some kind of logical sense and fashion. God has gifted her with an amazing spiritual gift to finish my thoughts. And she oftentimes finishes them for me because I start talking and I can't remember what I was talking about because I've moved on to the next thing. And she says, and this. I use the word thing a lot. The nouns I don't get along with. Sweetie, I need you to bring me that thing. What thing? The thing that's sitting over there on the thing. Which things are we talking about? You know the thing I need! Please! The, 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 the thing on the brown thing. The piano? Yes! I don't need the piano. I need the thing on the piano. Okay? This is why it is so critical for me to control my thoughts. Because when I am trying to pray, and this is, this, this is why I pray out loud oftentimes, okay? Because if I'm praying in my head, man, I don't complete a thought in my head before I'm off to the next one. So I start saying, Father, would you please bless Joe and help him to, I wonder what's for lunch. <laughs> I hope it's not that sandwich she made me yesterday. Because I really need to finish my message. What was my message about? It was on prayer. 
Oh, I'm supposed to be praying. Who was I praying for? Joe. Joe, I wonder if Joe had lunch. <laughs> I bet you he liked the sandwich I had yesterday. Okay, now, that's why I pray out loud. Because when I do what I'm saying, it helps me to focus. Okay, but God has called us to control our thoughts. He's given us the ability to control our thoughts. He's given us directions as to how to accomplish controlling our thoughts. Okay, we talk about that later. Look in uh, Philippians chapter 4. He gives you a whole bunch of things to help you control your thoughts. Now, one of the things that Isaiah says, Isaiah 55, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, that's interesting, because isn't he always near? Yes. Well, can he always be found? So when should we seek him? All the time, right? So when should we not seek him? Never. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Never. We should always seek him. So, if he is always near, and we're to always seek him, how often should we find him? Well, I hope you have better luck with that than I do. So if, if I don't find him, should I give up? No, of course not. We press on. We persevere. Okay? That's discipline. That's perseverance. We'll talk about those later. Okay? One of the key components to seeking God... Paul says in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, you guys should memorize this, this passage, okay? This is a passage whereby we set the benchmark for our lives, okay? Rejoice always. How often do we rejoice? Always. By the way, do you know what that word rejoice means? <clears throat> rejoice? What, what does that mean? To have exceeding or abundant joy. Did you know that? Take joy... Always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So let's, let's look at those real quick. How often do we rejoice? Always. Always. How often do we pray? Always. Always. Without ceasing. We don't ever stop. How often do we give thanks? Always. What do we have to give thanks for? Everything. Well, everything you've got, he's given you. What should we be praying for? Oh, boy. Everything. If you're not sure what you should be praying for, Vivian, would you share your list? <laughs> she gives you a lot of things to pray for. Honestly, you're not sure what to pray for? Take home one of the church rosters. Yes. Take home one of the church rosters. <coughs> And start praying for the people in this church. Not just the families. Pray for individual people. Pray for individual people. You're not sure what to pray for? <coughs> pray for this church. Pray for the health and wholeness of this church. That God would prevent the wolves and sheep's clothing from coming in here. Amen. Pray that we would be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. That we might know what God's will is. That we would accomplish the purposes that he has established this church for. You need something to pray for? Pray for the church leadership. Pray for the heads of each ministry that we have in this body. That the ministries that we have will be effective in accomplishing the purposes that God has established them for. Because our ultimate goal in this church, the number one thing that this church should be about, is getting the light out of here and out there. Okay? Knowing Christ and Him crucified. That's what we should be about. So praying without ceasing. Rejoicing always. How often should we have joy? Always. Well, what's there to be joyful about? Well, yeah, the same stuff to be thankful for. Think about everything that God is. You want to find out something about the character of God? Do a word study in Scripture. Just look up the names that he has given himself. The names that he uses to describe himself. Our peace, our healer, our banner, our righteousness, our provider. Those are just some of them. That's just some of them. 
the Almighty. He uses names so that we can understand a little bit about who he is. We'll never be able to fully understand him. He's infinite. I mean, we just get little tastes. And even sometimes the little tastes are overwhelming. Once you've kind of looked a little bit about who God is, then start looking at what he's done. And I'm not talking about all the stuff that he's given you. We'll get to that in a moment. Look at what he's done. By his very word, he created everything. And by his word, he keeps everything together. Everything is held together by his word. I can't keep anything together with my words. I can't hardly keep my words together. <laughs> and yet by his word, everything is held together. I don't know about you guys, but fall is my absolute favorite time of year. I think we've had an incredible fall this year. The colors, 4th of July has nothing on what God has done through this fall. The reds, the oranges, the auburns, the yellows, just beautiful. God did that. What he's done, what about the cross? What about taking a yucky, icky, dirty, filthy person like me and changing me completely? What about taking a yucky, icky, dirty, <coughs> filthy person like you and changing you completely? Because I know the person I am today is not the person I was before I came to salvation. You guys would not have liked that person. You may not like this person, but I'm not the same person I was there. There would have been a different reason you would not have liked that person. Okay? I see God working in so many people. And sometimes it's hard. You know, we come to him as a gnarly piece of wood. And sometimes he takes a rasp. Sometimes he takes a saw. Sometimes he takes sandpaper. And man, there's grinding, there's cutting, there's scraping. And I tell you what, he's making something polished and beautiful. Polished and beautiful. And sometimes all we see is the flying sawdust everywhere. And the pain and the hurt and the, the frustration. And the, Why am I never getting past this? God, please let me learn this lesson. I don't want to go through it again. God's had me going through some lessons. <laughs> I'm dense. That's all I can come up with. I'm just dense. Because he gives me the test. I fail it. He shows me everything I got wrong. He goes through and works the test through with me. And he says, see, right here, you missed it right here. This is what the correct answer should have been. And see right here, when you went from this one to this one, you go from this one to this one. And, and this is what it should look like. Great. It gives me the exact same test. And I get the exact same score. <laughs> and he comes through and he says, remember we talked about this. You were supposed to do this one. Remember this? It's true and false. There's only one other answer you can give. I know. I know. Okay. And a couple days later, he gives me the exact same test. And I sit there and I look and I go, 50-50. <sighs> but he's faithful because he keeps giving me the test over and over and over and over again. And God speaks to me in funny ways. Okay. I'm going to share with you, God speaks with me in funny ways. I had a, a tube, like, you know, from toilet paper or paper towel. I had a tube, and I threw it to the trash can. And it bounced off the counter, bounced off the wall, hit the edge of the trash can, and rolled right back to my feet. <laughs> now, see, yesterday I was, I was having a test, and I was doing a test. And I looked down at that thing at my feet, and I felt very clearly God said to me, I'm a God of second chances. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> Off the counter, off the wall, right in the center of the trash can. Now, I look at that and I go, okay, God, I don't know why you have to be so juvenile with me. <laughs> but I got your point. You need to get back out there and do this test again. You need to get back out there and do it right. He's a God of second chances. He doesn't ask us to be perfect the first time. You've got to remember, he has already made us perfect. We are his righteousness in Christ. What do we have to be joyful about? What has he done in us? 
What has He done for us? Who is He? If you can't find joy in those things, I would challenge you, you don't see those things in truth. You don't see them in truth. You're being deceived. Your eyes are being veiled. You're being blinded. Okay? Because if you truly know God, even the little bit that we're capable of knowing Him, if you can truly see everything that He's done for you, and you can see, you can look in honesty and see the things that He's doing to you, and even then, the things that He's doing through you, Shouldn't we want then to spend time in his presence? Scripture also tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. I get up several days a week and my first prayer is, God, I am weak today. I need your strength. Because I, I don't know about you guys, I wake up and I'm usually, Doink, I'm awake. I, there's no process for me. I'm sleeping and I'm awake. This morning I was sleeping, I was having a dream. And I heard Christy's hand on the doorknob, and I was awake. And as soon as she opened the door, I said, it's time to cut the potatoes. And I told her to get me up. I would cut the potatoes for her this morning. And I knew her, her day was busy, so I told her, come and get me up. I'll, I'll cut potatoes for you. So I, from a dream to cutting potatoes. That's how quick it goes. But I, a lot of times I wake up, and I just, I just go, God, there's no way I have the strength to do what you need me to do today. Please, God, give me your strength today. The joy of the Lord is our strength. How do we get the joy of the Lord? We get into His presence. We get into His presence. I tell you, spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in worship. Put worship music on. Put worship music on. Keep it going. Spend time being quiet before God. Boy, that's a tough discipline. That's a tough discipline. I go out every morning and I'm quiet before God. I, I, I pace on our deck now because my seat's always wet. So I have to walk because I don't like sitting in wet. And I put music on and I go out and I listen to music. It starts off usually with praise and worship songs. And I'll, I'll listen to praise and worship songs. And then I switch it over to instrumental songs. And, I, and then eventually God tells me, okay, just be quiet. Turn off the music. Just be quiet. I turn off the music and I just listen. And there's a lot of times he doesn't say a single thing to me. But I know he's there. I know that I know that I know he's there. And I can tell you why. Because when I go out there, there's a lot of times I go out there feeling frustrated, feeling anxious, feeling uptight, just feeling... <clears throat> and when I spend time in his presence, I come in and I don't feel... <clears throat> anymore. <clears throat> he takes that away from me. Because that, that can't exist in his presence. So, joy. Love and joy. You want joy? Get into his presence. Get into his presence. Spend time with him. Okay? Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, that you have shown us what a life led by your Spirit looks like. Father, I thank you that you have not left us alone to accomplish these things, but Father, you have given us your Spirit. That, Father, the fruit that, that you've listed here is not something that we can do in and of ourselves, but Father, it's something that we are active participants in, but it's, Father, it, it's the nature of your Spirit living in us. Help us, Father, day by day, moment by moment, to walk according to your Spirit. Father, to not gratify the lusts of our flesh, to not desire to do those things that our flesh would do that would drive us away from you. But, Father, to live moment by moment walking in your Spirit. Help us, Father, to learn, to embrace, to accept, to become. We thank you for these things, Father. We bless you in Jesus' name.